Uh, I invited Joan because I've been waiting for, I don't know, about 20 years for someone to do a, a mathematical model of a whole else. Because <laughs> I wanted to something to really work against. And so um, really this is, it should be really interesting to think about or see how she's thinking about it. So Joan, um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Um... Well, as you know, I'm John Ruffgarden. Uh, I'm retired from Stanford Biology. I live on the island of Kauai in Hawaii. And um, although I was ready to retire and move to a new place, I wasn't really ready to give up research. And when I, uh, so soon after I retired, I kept writing some papers, mostly in, about social behavior. And then uh, when I turned 70, a switch flicked and I said, aha, you've done enough. You've done whatever you can do that you can't make any difference from now on. So uh, I went to Antarctica, I went to a safari and I had a great old time, but I was on, I, but I met some people I was traveling with and one of them was about my age and he had a PhD in chemistry and he went back and he went to law school and then started a practice in pro bono law. And then it got me thinking, you know, I really should, should keep, keep going because I still had a lot of questions I was interested in trying to solve and, and it's fun. Um, so what brought me to this Holobiont thing? I, I was in, uh, at a workshop in, in Israel and the Rosenbergs were there along with Scott Gilbert and Jean Rosenberg came up to me, I believe, I believe it was Jean, and said, uh, what do you have against microbes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, well, I have nothing against microbes. Because I was at this conference and I was giving a lecture on uh, work I was doing on social behavior in birds and in family organization in birds. He said, what do you have against microbes? I said, I don't have anything against so I never give them much thought. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, I think it was Ilana then who gave a talk and talked about the whole genome. And the, these folks, as you know, are microbiologists. They haven't got a lot of experience in evolutionary biology. And, uh, but I, I was intrigued by the concept of the whole genome because it, it represented an extensible genome. So that we, of course, assume that you're stuck with your chromosomes, you're stuck with your genes. But the idea of a hologenome is that you can swap in genes from the outside and, uh, and thereby build your genome uh, adaptively uh, during your life. And I thought it was a very interesting idea, but it was pretty clear that we couldn't just, at least to me, it seemed pretty clear that you couldn't just extend any theory we already had on the books to cover this. And so I uh, went back to the drawing board on it. And, um, and Scott Gilbert was very helpful on this. And, and it turns, and, they, and I think I had lunch with Ilana and Ilana said, you know, we really need a model for how uh, holobiont evolution might work because no one's taking us seriously in evolutionary biology. And we really need a model for how the process might, might work. And then Scott uh, reinforced that. And, and I came, came from a biology department where there was often quite a bit of hostility between the ecology evolution group and the molecular biology folks. And this represented an outreach uh, by molecular people to, to someone who knew evolutionary biology. And I thought that I had to respond to this, that this was very unusual to have a request to have evolutionary thinking uh, being done uh, or being carried out uh, on essentially uh, molecular and microbial um, processes. So, uh, and then it turns out, Scott just told me this the other day, that she and Ilana and Jean actually conspired in advance to uh, ask evolutionists to work on this. And they may have asked a few other folks too, but I, uh, I went for it. Um, so I, I spent quite a while trying to figure out how to approach this. I went down a bunch of dead ends. 
and basically in the end took what amounts to a population biology type framework for uh, how to conceptualize uh, Lobion evolution. And uh, so the, if, as you know, if you're doing a model, one of the first questions you have to ask is what is the state variable? You know, what are you doing? And, um, and the main way that I thought it would be a good, good idea to uh, conceptualize uh, what I termed a hologenotype was as a nested, da uh, nested data structure. So you have, for any given holobiont, say a coral, coral polyp, uh, there would be a nucleus in it with some genes, and then there'd be a bunch of uh, uh, cells in one niche and a bunch of microbes in another niche. And you can represent that as a hierarchical data structure. And the purpose of the theory would be to take a picture of the distribution of hologenotypes in one generation and project to or map to the distribution of genotype or hologenotypes in the next generation. And the objective, uh, as I came to think of it, was to formulate a theory for holobiont evolution that was logically parallel to ordinary population genetics, in which you take a description of the gene pool, typically a vector of gene frequencies at time t, then you look at the selection and the mating system, and you project what the uh, distribution of gene frequencies will be at time t plus one. So in a similar vein, the idea here would be to project the distribution of hologenotypes at time t to what it would be at time t plus one, taking into account the processes that are take place during the generation. Now, uh, the initial thinking uh, by the folks I was interacting with was focused on vertical transmission, uh, that the microbes uh, uh, would transmit vertically, uh, and, and according to a life cycle of this sort right here, in which, um, whoops, keep happy. Um, in which you have, uh, by the way, you are still recording this? Yes, um, I uh, can either stop. Yeah. No, 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 please do that, because I don't see the little red button. <laughs> yeah, I, I see it. OK. All good. Uh, so um, if you start out with uh, a set of hologenotypes right here, distribution of hologenotypes, then within the generation, uh, the microbes proliferate, and as you can see right here, we go from one to two, to two and f four to five and so forth. And then there's holobiont selection, which means there's differential production of uh, both host, juvenile hosts and, and their microbes, depending on the composition. And in the case of a mutualist, which is why these are colored in green, Cell uh, hosts with lots of mutualists make lots of mutualist offspring. Cells without many mutualists don't make so many. And there's vertical transmission in the sense that uh, the juvenile hosts uh, have the same microbial composition as the parental host. And then, then there's a transfer pool where there's a limited amount of microbial mixing that goes on. If there's no microbial mixing at all, then it turns into clone selection. So uh, this implemented uh, the spirit of what the Rosenbergs in particular were talking about concerning vertical uh, transmission. And although uh, direct vertical transmission in the gametes isn't all that common, there's what I was calling a, a, a local neighborhood type transmission going on where a juvenile bird might accumulate bacteria or microbes from it, from the nest that it's raised in. And of course, in mammals, uh, the fetus accumulates bacteria from the birth canal and so forth. But uh, as I grew into this literature more, it was clear there was a lot of objection uh, to the assumption of vertical transmission. And, and I 
took that very seriously. So there was a lot of attempt at the time, I think, to uh, dismiss the objections and to shore up the evidence for vertical transmission, but it, it wasn't going to succeed because there's not that much vertical transmission. And, and so I decided to bite the bullet and see if I could instead go to the other extreme and assume that there was completely horizontal transmission. And that's what led to this life cycle right here, which is what was in the model that um, uh, you talked about last week. Uh, and I'm very grateful that, that you did that. So here, the only difference is that the microbes are uh, contributed to a microbe pool and then the juvenile hosts are colonized in this case by Poisson sampling from the juvenile from, from the microbial source pool and this then uh, provides a, a, a contrast between two life cycles one of which is completely horizontal and the other which is completely vertical except for a minimum amount of uh, microbial mixing here. Now, the interesting finding here is that for both life cycles, there's qualitatively the same outcome, that uh, in the case of the vertical transmission, if you have uh, an initial distribution of hologenotype frequencies like this, where, and the, the, the holoviant fitness is an increasing function of the number of microbes in it, which would be the case for a mutualist, then through time, the distribution of hologenotype frequencies piles up over here. And with horizontal transmission, the same thing occurs. If this is your initial distribution, then uh, through time, uh, the po population of holobionts comes to contain primarily individuals with more microbes. This is, of course, an expected outcome because it's adaptive to have lots of these uh, microbes. Um, and so the rationale for this is that uh, the, the, during the course of the reviewing, it became clear that there was a, a correspondence between these two processes of horizontal and vertical transmission with the ideas of um, uh, multi-level selection type one and multi-level selection type two, where vertical transmission corresponds almost exactly to what's been described as multi-level selection type one, in which uh, uh, the host and the microbes in it uh, evolve together and, and comprise a lineage. But this uh, horizontal transmission case is much more interesting in some respects, because this corresponds roughly to a kind of type one, uh, uh, multi-level selection. And, and I gather that you've already been that you've already been talking about this because Forrest just sent me some slides from a presentation I think earlier this month in which you had raised the uh, issue of type one and type two uh, multi-level yeah. selection. You and might type, uh, Joan, you might just remind them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so, you, so hopefully you've heard about it before. Yeah, and <laughs> the idea uh, classically for type one selection, multi-level selection is uh, analogized really, uh, Maynard Smith developed a model in which there was a haystack and little mice get into the haystack. And when they're in the haystack, uh, th they're in a, a social environment in which they evolve cooperation and so forth. And the, mi the mice within a haystack which has more cooperation will send out more propagules to the next generation, which will then colonize uh, more haystacks. And so the haystack winds up being a physical feature of the environment, which creates a context in which uh, you can get the evolution of cooperation. But of course, the haystack itself is not a living entity. Uh, it's just a recurring physical feature of the environment that, that provides a place. Now, holobiont, however, uh, differs in that the host itself is evolving. And, and so it's not only the microbes that are evolving, it's also the, uh, the host. And so it depends if you're a lumper or a splitter on this. Uh, is holobiont selection with 
with the horizontal transfer just a version of multi-level selection type one, or is it its own thing? Um, and I, I think it's different enough to consider it distinctive, but as I say, you can be a lumper or a splitter and it's, it's subjective as to how you call it. Now, as a result of that, uh, of course, one of the big problems, then I was sort of interested in, in just what the reception would be to a model of this sort, because it made, of course, a lot of simplifications and, and it was interested in what people would get upset about, you know, where were the, where were the big uh, improvements needed. And one thing that people really wanted right away was uh, multiple kinds of strains and multiple um, alleles in the host. They actually wanted genetic evolution. And in the case of uh, the evolution in the first paper, where it's the abundance of the microbes that's being selected, the microbes are, in a sense, gene copy numbers. So I've often said that when you look at a holobiont, it's like looking at an Escher painting. You can look at it from either side. You can take the host side, in which case the microbes are just uh, uh, gene encapsulated genes, or you can take the microbiome side or the microbe side in the host and the microbes are little organisms and microbiome community uh, diversity and so forth is, is a, a community structure. Whereas diversity of the microbiome from the host point of view is nothing but a polymorphism. And so that's what people wanted was uh, uh, a couple strains at least. So, uh, so that led to the second paper that I've circulated to you, which is still a preprint and uh, I made two big assumptions here because the, the first paper relied on really a computer iteration of a dynamical model. And that's not as satisfactory as a mathematical analysis of it because you can't explore as much, you can't find out as much. So um, here the setup is, and it's horizontal transmission, here the setup is we have the ju empty juvenile hosts. And, oh, the two assumptions are first, that the microbiome comes to population dy dynamic equilibrium within, within a generation. So in the previous treatment, the population was actual, the microbial population was actually growing during the course of the life cycle. In this version, the, the microbial dynamics come to equilibrium. So you get an equilibrium micro microbial, a within host microbial dynamic equilibrium. And secondly, that the uh, microbial source pool is dilute. Okay, so the first, you can see right here from the first assumption that after the juvenile hosts are colonized, then they come to equilibrium and K indicates the carrying capacity of the host for microbe one. This is carrying capacity for microbe two. And then this is the equilibrium population size if most, both microbes are co-occurring. Now, the second assumption is that the microbial pores pool is dilute. And it's dilute enough that we can get binomial sampling of the gene pool, of the microbial source pool to uh, stock the initial condition of the hosts. Now, uh, I actually think, I, I think both these assumptions are realistic, but the reason in any, in any case, the theoretical reason for, for needing this assumption is that if the microbial source pool is, uh, um, not dilute, if, if it's dense, then uh, different micro, different hosts will be colonized, will all be colonized by both species of microbes. Now, perhaps in different initial ratios, but they'll still wind up getting the same species composition within the uh, initial propagules or the, the initial colonized colonists. And as a result, once they come to population dynamic equilibrium, they'll all be the same. So with a dense 
uh, source pool, uh, you get the possibility of hologenotypic variation being erased by the within host dynamics. On the other hand, if it's very dilute, well then some juvenile hosts will get only green ones, some will get only brown ones, and some will get both. And so you wind up getting then a diversity of, uh, of, initial, of holobiont configurations and holobiont selection relies on diversity of holobiont configurations just the way natural selection uh, relies on genetic diversity for evolutionary progress. So they're the two assumptions. And then if you do that, you can then uh, write a theory which is completely mathematical rather than relying on computer iteration. And so just to bring everybody up to speed here, if you remember your population genetics texts, hopefully, this is what you'll see in your um, uh, population biology 101, where uh, if P is the gene frequency for allele one, one minus P would be the frequency of allele two. The fitnesses would be for the homozygote would be W11, heterozygote W12, this one, other one would be W22. And then the marginal fitness of allele one would be P times W11 plus one minus P to the one two. The marginal fitness of W2 is similar. The overall mean fitness is then the average of those two. And then the equation to predict the gene pool frequency at t plus one, given the gene pool frequency at t, is the ratio of the marginal to the total. Now, if the marginal, if both marginal fitnesses are equal, well, then um, w1 equals w2, and the average is also w1 and w2. And so the numerator and the denominator cancel out, giving you one here. So if the numerator equals the denominator here, then PT plus one equals PT, and so you've got yourself an equilibrium. So that's the standard population genetic criterion for uh, an equilibrium gene frequency in the gene pool. Now what's neat is that if you go through the life cycle right here and you work up all the uh, little, uh, <laughs> the frequencies of every hologenotype, add them all up and so on, you come out with this formulation here that you can define now. Okay, now the, the variation here is in strains. So P is strain one, which is green. The one minus P is the frequency of strain two. And you can define these uh, coefficients here that I'm calling multi-level fitnesses, multi-level fitnesses, because they're the product of K1, which is the uh, within generation population size times W1, which is the overall holobiont selection. So that you're getting basically K selection within, gener within host and R selection between host. And that's what uh, these coefficients are. The only difference between standard genetics is you wind up getting uh, all of them. You, you get four instead of three. Nonetheless, with that, uh, if you work through the, the life cycle, you wind up being able to define a um, marginal fitness for strain one, a marginal fitness for strain two, an overall fitness, and you come up with an equation which is logically the counterpart of the standard equation from population genetics. And so this implements the uh, notion that the uh, uh, microbes can be viewed as a kind of gene. Now, uh, let's see. Okay, and if you iterate those equations, uh, then you find that you can solve for the equilibrium. Uh, it's when the numerator equals the, the denominator in that preceding equation. And that equilibrium corresponds to maximizing the equality between the marginal fitnesses of both strains. Okay, now take two host alleles with vertical transmission. Now this, this would of course be standard population genetics. So now that we're gonna assume there's only one kind of microbial microbe 
And now there are two kinds of alleles right here in the host nucleus. But uh, each host genotype gives rise to a different carrying capacity for the microbes. And so from random union of gametes, we would get a Hardy-Weinberg type initial condition for the uh, host genotypes. And it can run through this cycle. And here then are the equations for the uh, um, dynamics of the host genome, which is actually just the standard stuff from population genetics that I showed you earlier. And this is the approach to equilibrium. And again, we have now allele marginal mean fit, marginal fitness equality being maximized. So if you put them together, uh, you get this system right here, two host alleles with vertical transmission, two microbial strains with horizontal. Now it gets really interesting. Um, now, even though this looks complicated, it's actually not complicated if you, if you track the logic right here. Uh, this part right here is the microbial part, but then averaged over the different host genotypes. This is the host part averaged over the different microbial genotypes. And then you get two equations, one for the gene pool, uh, one for the allele composition at time t plus one, one for the uh, p right here is the strain composition at time t plus one, and q is the allele composition at time t plus one. And these are simultaneous equations. But these are shorthand for what's going on in the uh, overall model because the overall model involves mapping the the full hologenotype distribution at time t to the hologenotype distribution at time t plus one it's just that because of the binomial sampling of the microbial source pool and the random union of gametes here you're able to condense the overall description into the, into just two equations rather than um, than uh, nine equations now, uh, I think this diagram is really interesting because what it does is it points out a logical parallel between, the, between random union of gametes from the host gamete pool and binomial sampling from the microbial source pool. These are really complement, these, these are complementary processes and recombination is taking place because of random assortment of gametes, but you're also getting recombination from the microbial part of the hologenome through the, through the sampling right here. And the full, uh, because it's a two, two component system, you wind up getting many possible equilibria these are the corner equilibria, and these are boundary equilibria, or edge equilibria, and this would be an interior equilibrium. And for some parameter values, the interior equilibrium would be stable. You can find that in advance when, when all the corner ones are unstable, and there's simple conditions for that. And so when you have the joint dynamics of both the allele and the micro, the, both the alleles in the host nucleus and the the uh, strains in the microbiome, you get something like this, where different initial conditions lead to this equilibrium. And uh, you might ask, what if anything is being maximized as a result of this joint evolution of both components of the whole genome? Um, and here's a, a surface right here for the uh, product of the marginal fitness equality for the for the microbiome and the marginal fitness equality for the alleles and at this point right here which we can also see graphed here the uh, mar the, the equality of both the uh, marginal fitnesses of the alleles to one another and the marginal fitnesses of the strains to one another is maximized and what's interesting about that is that it is not the mean holobiont fitness. 
so that we don't get the evolution of these joint components of the hologenome maximizing holobiont fitness as a whole. Um, because this is the surface of the holobiont mean fitness, and this is where the equilibrium is. And if you were, so to speak, to sculpt an ideal uh, holobiont and count on holobiont selection to give it to you, it won't. They will give, give to you uh, the outcome from the preceding slide. And then lastly, um, I tried to see if I could extend the idea of an evolutionarily stable strategy to a um, to holobiont evolution. And this is, um, I've had to take a couple stabs at this. The version of the paper I've sent you now, I believe is correct uh, in this, on, on this matter. The, uh, what we're interested in is the stability of this corner equilibrium up here in which strain one is present at 100% and strain and allele one is present at 100%. And we ask, can any other strain or any other allele invade when rare? Uh, if not, then allele one and strain one are stable to invasion by any alternative drawn from a set of possible alternatives. And then that will be called a holostable equilibrium. And the phenotype that gives rise to that genotype would be called a holostable strategy. And this is the way I've set that up, that from the conditions for that equilibrium to be stable from the population genetic, from the genetic analysis, you'd have to get uh, this in terms of the coefficients. Now, the important point is the transition from a genetic analysis to a corresponding phenotypic analysis. Now, the, the multi-level fitnesses unpacked to products of the uh, population sizes and the holobiont fitness. You, you'll recall that the multi-level fitness is the product of the within host K selection part and the between host R selection part. So I've just unpacked that into here. Now, these X and Ys are not gene frequencies anymore. These are now phenotype, phenotypic variables. So they refer to a, a feature of the, uh, uh, in the case of X, to the host and a feature of the strain. And the feature of the host will be evolution, evolutionary stable, holostable, if any mutant phenotype is still less than uh, the one that's already there, the focal phenotype. And similarly, any mutant strain, the phenotype of any mutant strain uh, here will be, uh, sorry, the phenotype of any focal strain, Y hat, will be stable, will be holostable if it's stable to invasion by a strain with any other mutant phenotype, a mutant strain with any other phenotype from a set of all possible phenotypes. And so I worked out in the paper a case where we have this as the phenotype model, where the interpretation here was X is uh, the amount by which a host helps its microbe, Y is an amount by which the microbe helps its host. And so I was assuming that um, this would represent the dynamics of the host microbe cooperation. And, and I assigned some parameter values to these. And you can solve then for, this would be the optimal effort that a host should help its, according to these parameter values here, the optimal effort the host should help its microbes. This should be how much its microbes should help its host. The product of these, which I'm calling the altruistic synergy, works out to be that. Now, this is what the fitness would be of the host and the microbes if they didn't help one another at all. And this is what the fitness of the host and microbes would be if they did help. And so I'm arguing that this would be a holostable strategy in the sense that any um, host that 
that uh, d uh, helped more or less than 0.3, and any microbe which helped less than one um, would not be able to uh, invade a host that did these. So we'll see if that's a useful concept. It's, it's an attempt to extend the idea of an evolutionarily stable strategy, uh, which is widely used in evolutionary biology, originally by Maynard Smith, to holobiont evolution. So in conclusion, uh, this is what I come up with. So this, the first column here is for the first paper, this, and then we have the second paper, and then we have some general remarks. So the hologenotype, I think, is a can be usefully represented as a hierarchical data structure. And then holobiont selection theory maps the hologenotype distribution at t to t plus one. And then holobiont selection works with both vertical and horizontal microbial tr transmission, uh, both for directional selection and for other types as well. And then holobiont selection with vertical transmission corresponds to multi-level selection two, and with horizontal transmission, roughly to multi-selection level, multi-selection one. Now, in the second paper, what I take, what I think that shows is that random colonization by microbes is the counterpart of random union of gametes. And then multi-level fitness for a microbe. So there is a, a notion of a multi-level fitness, which I think might be analogous or a, a similar, potentially of similar importance to the notion of inclusive fitness in evolutionary biology. But here we would have the notion of multi-level fitness for a microbe combines within host K selection with between host R selection. And then seven, the micro, the whole genome is similar to a two locus genetic system. Perhaps I didn't bring this out clearly enough. Is that this this idea of the evolution not leading to a maximization of the overall holobiont fitness is um, also found in multi locus genetic systems. It's been known for decades now that if you have uh, one selection on one locus on, on a on a gene on a phenotype that depends on a two locus genotype that you may not get fitness maximization from it. And I think that's what's going on here, is that you basically have uh, two components of the genotype, overall of the genotype, and uh, they don't combine uh, to give you an overall um, uh, optimal outcome. And that gave rise in po standard population genetics to a large theory about the evolution of the adaptive uh, geometry, if you will, of the genome and, and models for the evolution of linkage tightening and the uh, consequences of mutation rates and so forth, all of which are processes which interfere with realizing overall fitness maximization. I think that's what's happening here, as we really have two components to the whole genome. And finally, ho host microbiome coadaptation may express a hologenotype a holostable strategy, which is the extension of, of an evolutionarily stable strategy. And then more generally, it seems to me that the hologenome with holobiont selection can be made evolutionarily rigorous. And holobiont theory is useful because it considers both the host and the microbiome simultaneously. Now, holobionts do and this is maybe quite contentious. Holobionts do not destabilize individuality, the notion of individuality, it, it seems to me, because the notion of individuality of a holobiont derives from the individuality of the host. So if you take a Carl Pollock, for example, it, what's problematic about that as an individual? It seems to me that the, that the, that the polyp What's problematic about the polyp as an individual is that it's a member of a colony of other polyps, not that it has zoosanthellae in it. Now, there could be some, some considerable argument about that. And finally, that holobionts with horizontal microbe transmission 
do destabilize the notion of inheritance by replacing lineal inheritance with collective inheritance. And I had uh, a rather spirited discussion about this that's online with Ford Doolittle about this because in my view, uh, Darwin wrote, of course, before inheritance was, um, before the mechanism of inheritance was known. And so there's a tendency, there's a tendency today to equate uh, Dar Darwinian evolution with Mendelian evolution. But I think that uh, what I've been terming horizontal, uh, what I've been terming collective inheritance would be perfectly satisfactory to Darwin because with collective inheritance, you still get descent with modification, which is what Darwinian evolution is basically about. And uh, it's uh, hi a hi historical accident, you might say, that Mendelian inheritance has taken such a prominent role uh, due to the founding of population genetics and the work of Haldane and right and so forth, but we could definitely have other modes of inheritance, which would still be Darwinian and authorize a Darwinian understanding of evolution. And I think lineal and uh, collective inheritance does that as well. So that those points 11 and 12 are uh, definitely contentious, especially uh, in philosophical, to, to a philosophical audience. And so we'll see how it plays out. Anyway, thanks so much for your interest in this, and I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yay. Virtual clapping. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool. So uh, let's jump in and ask questions. Who wants to go first? Pete? Um, sure, I got a couple. Um, one is, uh, you know, you explain really nicely why uh, you have those two requirements for those two assumptions. Uh, one is the binomial selection. Uh, but the reason you needed binomial selection is because your population st stability, population reaching equilibrium within one generation would wipe out all differences in differential inheritance if you didn't have that. So what's the reason for having this single generation equilibrium? Is that, because that, that's the reason you have binomial selection, but the reason for the equilibrium in one generation, is that a computational thing to be able to assume equilibrium right now? Well, yes, uh, yes, it is a computational thing, but I also think it's true because after all the, uh, uh, the host lives for, for a, a year typically and the bacteria reproduce on a, um, every week or two. So there's more than enough time for the uh, microbiome to come to uh, ecological equilibrium within the host in the host's generation. Okay. Um, and then there's this K selection within a host and R selection between hosts. Um, intuitively, I'd have thought it'd be the other way around, you know, because, you know, hosts would tend, relative to the microbes, would tend to be more K selected. And, but well, yeah. yeah, but um, there's density dependence in in the host, and so within hosts, and th that's why because they come to population dynamic equilibrium. So you get a carrying capacity, or you get two competing species with a competition coefficient, or something like that. Whereas there's no density dependence in the host, so the host population is growing potentially infinitely, yeah. um, and uh, you know that's fine. We could introduce uh, an entire level of host community dynamics where hosts of one species of coral interact with hosts of another with another species of coral and then you'd wind up having density dependence on the hosts as well but um, that you know that would be that'd be an extension and uh, I'm not sure it's warranted at this point okay thanks yeah thank you so I would have a question, which um, it's probably just because I don't understand exactly. So what will happen, um, in your opinion, if there are generations where 
you don't have the, the same microbial associations. Does that make sense? Like, um, like one generation has a certain set of microbes and then, you know, the next generation of that, that individual um, uh, moving through time does not have the same microbes. And then like two generations later, you end up with the same microbes. Um, does that make sense? So the community changes um, between generations of the host itself. Or is that just too far afield at this point? No, that's interesting possibility, uh, particularly if the, uh, the the microbial species are dilute enough, then you could get uh, some species. Well, actually, as I think about it, that that's even included already, because okay. if we go back to. Uh, this here, you could get, take hosts that happen to have uh, red alleles in them. Mm -hmm. Now this host has only green algae. This one has green and brown microbes. This one has only brown algae. Now you could then say that, that this host had a different, well, it's, this host has a different microbiome than this host. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it's dilute enough, and then you look across hosts, you'll find, and again, you need a population view of, the, of all the different hosts, because you're basically getting a meta population of hosts. So if you look at the distribution of ho across hosts, you would find even on this model that some would have some uh, microbiomes and others would have other microbiomes. And if you extended this from just two to to like 30 or n different uh, microbes, you would then find a distribution of uh, species compositions of the microbes uh, in, in different hosts at the time of colonization. And then that would play out uh, by following this life cycle. And, and then from that, you could predict the relative, um, uh, let's call them, I, I'm not sure if fitness is the right word, but the relative contribution to fitness yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. to do yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah that would be uh, mm -hmm. relatively uh, easy addition to this model it would be just to increase the number of uh, whoops microbes the the problem would be writing down these sorts of equations here once you start having a whole bunch of them a whole bunch of microbes these equations can get pretty complicated. So what you need to do is to code a way <laughs> to generate the equations. Right. So, uh, because you could, uh, with lexical uh, analysis uh, modeling, you could actually put in the number of microbes and then make the program itself generate the equations that you would then iterate. So mm -hmm. the uh, um, you, you could do that. That'd be that'd be a nice programming problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, to what extent would that tend to sort of wash out the quantum effect of the diluting? Does that make any sense? Yeah, uh, I, I don't. I I don't think so offhand, uh, because you'd get a what you'd get over here would be a a, a multinomial sampling, right. Right, and then uh, so it, it ought to be equivalent to a one locus n allele problem from from classical population genetics if we just look at the micro part of it, and and so I would anticipate that that you could derive formulas that were pretty much analogous to the one locus n allele theory from classical genetics. Cool. I have a question. I think maybe I misunderstood for this question, or I wanted to clarify if I had missed anything. For is what you asked was um, that you could lose, for example, for one generation, one microbial strain all the way, like let's say the green or the brown, but it could, re 
and not being transmitted between holobionts as it goes on the cycle. And then it could um, come back later. Well, that's I mean, what I understood, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so basically the, and this a, a little is, um, it's uh, the lumpers, it's splitters, right? <laughs> so the, uh, but at the, at the, whatever we want to call a strain, um, strain in species. So basically what we're observing um, in the coral and, and in humans, right, is that the, there's no real continuation of a strain amongst, uh, amongst the populations, right? So you get very different strains by individual. Um, and so I'm just wondering, but collectively, you know, within all the corals, for example, you, you still have that, that yeah. pool that you're picking out of, right? So it may not matter. But in the, any individual coral isn't going to um, uh, represent or look like, um, at the strain level, like any other coral, um, that right. that's trying to get out. Yeah, yeah that's right. That, that's still in here. Uh, and uh, is that fair, uh, Tony? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify yeah. because, and then the question for you it would be: Do you have? I remember when we were going over one of the models that you had an external, sorry, no. Do you have an environmental pool of microbes in this model where, yeah, where the microbes could be you know, coming to the host also from the environment? No, um, yeah, we, that's, that's a question that has come up now as to whether there's a separate ecology for the mi microbes in the environment. Like suppose there's a, this microbial source pool is a place where microbes themselves can just reproduce and all by themselves. And, and we wind up getting this pool supplying just a small aliquot, you might say, of uh, colonists. And it was meanwhile, pretty self-sustaining. Uh, well, I, I haven't modeled that. that that could be modeled. Um, the issue is, first of all, I'm not sure empirically how much free living life there is to these, uh, uh, to the zoosanthellae out in nature. I, I don't know if they're reproducing out there as a self-sustaining uh, uh, algal population. And so I'm not clear about the facts of that. And then secondly, there's a question of habitat choice. Put yourself in the position, if you will, of a microbe and say, where am I going to be better? Am I going to be better in a host or am I going to be better just living in the water by myself? And, uh, and if one is better than the other, that's where you should go. It's similar to the habitat selection problem in, uh, in ecology. Um, where you know what people used to talk about when does a bee leave a flower and basically you're supposed to stay in the flower until uh you could do better by going somewhere else but you don't stick around uh, uh, uh until there's an actual difference and and it's, that's the problem i'm having here conceptualizing the 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 algae that's sitting in the pool um because if it's sitting in the pool, then the pool must be better for it. So it shouldn't bother with the micro with the host at all. Whereas if the host is better for it, then it shouldn't bother sitting around in the in the pool in the ocean. So I can't see why the setup would be um, would would be logically consistent. You see what I'm saying? I think in the case of the the zooxanthellae that cycles right i mean on a on a re pretty much seasonal basis that during periods of high temperature it's clearly better for the zooxanthellae to be outside the host and in periods of you know more average temp temperatures it's better for them to be inside the host and that's also coupled to the fact that the zooxanthellae can only reproduce sexually outside of the host ah so there's kind of this like i won't call it alternation of generation but 
this alternation of, of um, reproductive strategy that is determined by if you're host associated or not. So well, it's, it's, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't have that in here. Uh, but again, as you say in the, in the Zosenthali leaving, they leave en masse. They don't just, it's not as though some of them hang out, right? No, actually, they're selective. So we've shown pretty clearly that the, these Duris dinium um, uh, symbionts are typically selectively retained within the coral, and it will just expel the Cladocopium symbionts. Yeah. Um, and then the Cladocopiums actually look like they go out, do sexual reproduction, recombine, and then are retaken up after, after the bleaching stops. Yeah, but, the, but the, what you're saying, the coral ejects them, but I mean, how do you know they're not going off on their own uh, and acquiescing, so to speak, to the ejection? <laughs> um, I, I think that's actually exactly what is happening. Oh, well, okay. That's, that's, I mean, I think the coral ejects them, but then they go out on their own. They, they yeah. do these things on their own and then they, then they're brought back in as a whole different kind of uh, new, new population that yeah. has evolved separate from the host. Yeah, but they're happy to go is your point, right? Yeah, actually, I, I think they probably trigger being ejected, yeah. right? Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, right. it's really unclear actually who kind of, I mean, it's clear that the host ultimately decides to expel them but the, the, the signaling is probably derived from the algae initially. Okay. All right, well, that, uh, I don't have the, um, the a complex algal life cycle in this. So um, th that's interesting. And uh, uh, you, you know, could put that on the list of things to do. <laughs> no, but, I, I, but with respect to uh, whether, um, whether they should be in one place or the other, uh, what you're saying is still consistent with they stay uh, as a population w where it's best for them. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I just have a quick question. Mm, yeah. So I just have one question regarding this horizontal transmission. Basically, horizontal transmission is governed by the this distribution, like you use the Poisson distribution in one previous case, now it's a binomial sampling, right? It's, yeah. it's governed by that one. How realistic are this distribution or sampling you have taken, what's actually happening in reality, how true it is, and also does your result may depend on the sampling choice we have, we take, or is there any options we can do further or something like that? Well, the outcome, the outcome would definitely depend on uh, the, the sampling process that you assumed. And just the way in population genetics, the outcome depends on the mating system. I mean, that's my point, is that the sampling uh, process is the logical counterpart of the mating system. And uh, the, the choice, of course, of the of Poisson sampling is that that's the simplest model for uh, generating a distribution of initial numbers. Um, and then the binomial sampling is the simplest model for the generation of uh, different compositions. So uh, you know, what, what can I say? Uh, if you vary those assumptions, you would vary the conclusions. But I don't know if you'd qualitatively vary the conclusions because again, if we look by analogy to population genetics and the role of different mating systems, it's not as though our theory of evolution is impacted by, by that. It's, uh, it's the, the quantitative differences in the gene frequencies that you'll get with inbreeding versus outbreeding versus submating and, and uh, assortative mating and all of these sorts of things. But we still know there's natural selection going on, operating on variation. So here, if you went to a different kind of uh, sampling from binomial sampling, we'd still wind up getting um, differential re uh, reproduction of... Uh, holobionts depending on the, the, the diversity of holobionts. So, so, so and, and we don't have any data, of course, actually on this, because of course, we, this is a new model. Of, I mean, people haven't had a chance to digest this and see if it's even worth taking data on yet. And, uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, but, you know, when, when I think about the, the fact, yeah. 
Can I interrupt? Can you tell me what that data is? What, what would you test the model? Um, well, I, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the key things would be to, to test assumptions right here. I, I would like to know more about uh, the, the concentration of, of the symbionts that are about to do the colonizing. And are, are they dilute, as I've been assuming? And uh, that would be, I, I know Margaret uh, here in Hawaii has data on squid vib, uh, vibrio. And she, in some discussions, had some numbers about the concentration of the uh, vibrio in the water. And if, if you knew something like that for the zooxanthellae species, it's just what their concentrations were. Yeah, uh, that, that'd be very relevant. Yeah, um, I mean, we know quite a bit about the how many zooxanthellae there are out there, and and also how many of the bacteria there are. I mean, as long as you're willing to lump them a little. The problem is, is our data sets tend to um, they won't be strain level. They're more like a little higher than that. But other than that, they're, I mean, there's a lot of zooxanthellae in the environment. Um, but I don't think that, that being said, I don't think that your assumption that they're very dilute as from this point, from the recruitment to the animal is, is there's no real reason to throw that out because um, it, it, you know, it's really hard to tell what that collision rate is. <laughs> no matter yeah, exactly, what. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that would be one thing. Uh, uh, the other thing, so it's a kind of mechanistic model that I have here. Mm -hmm. And we could add other mechanisms, or if some of the mechanisms aren't correct, just remove them. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a... Uh, a lock. I'm not a player in this uh, in the debates about this. <laughs> I'm really pretty much a, a technician and doing the modeling. And uh, so, if some of the assumptions are wrong, well, then we'll we'll redo it. But uh, the other assumption, which alludes really to, I think, what you might have been leading to, is whether we can assume a, uh, that they come to population dynamic equilibrium. Because if you're basically within host, because if the microbiome is doing a lot of turnover within the host, within the host life cycle, we're getting succession and all sorts of things going on in there. Um, then uh, what, what I, and, it, and if the selection is continuous too, right? because I have a discrete generation model right here. Mm -hmm. So if, if we weren't getting a discrete generation and we're getting uh, age structured population and so forth. You know, the problem is we could just make it really complicated and we have to ask for, for all the time whether or not what we learn is worth the complication. And, and so I'm always juggling whether or not uh, an, adding an assumption is likely to bear on a significant conceptual issue. And uh, and, and that's where that, that's where the craftsmanship comes in. Uh, anyone can solve math, but build, building the model uh, and and getting community buy-in really is uh, one of the major major problems. Yeah. One of the the things from our point of view is that um, the better the that um, the math is, it helps us a lot with. Uh, asking the questions in the data sets. Because for the most part, we can ask pretty sophisticated um, questions because of how, the, how much data we have anymore. Um, but we have to do effectively a little bit. And the math really helps us, or the models really help us there. So um, yeah, so I mean, it, attacking the assumptions is a good idea, right? Just seeing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I mean, people couldn't figure out. I remember when I was in Israel, they couldn't figure out how this would work. 
you know, and uh, as your, you had a paper that you sent this morning, the one uh, with Hester. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I bring that up right here, yeah, you, you used a sentence in here, um, statements that hologenomes are integrated such that they are free from conflict has eroded any serious consideration by evolutionary theorists. And I think there's some truth in that. It's a strong statement, of course, mm -hmm. but um, there was a uh, there were a lot of statements being made about holobionts, which had an almost otherworldly flavor to them, and and I I think this is understandable because these folks are not evolutionary biologists and and they're not ecologists either. They're microbiologists and they uh, really don't know how to approach this. But I give them credit for saying, well, really we need a model. Uh, to uh, they didn't about. say they, they didn't say they needed a model. So yeah. when we first when it was when we were first arguing about it was like I don't know 2005 ish, yeah. and we had this thing um, on a bus, and uh, Nancy Moran was there, and yeah. we're like, you guys don't come up with a model, and you just keep saying this stuff, you're going to just alienate everybody, and so. <laughs> Finally, they're coming up with a model. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think they had seen seen the light, and certainly yeah. Scott Gilbert had. And by the time I met them, which was maybe five years ago, uh, you know, the, their attitude to that changed. They knew they they had helped. And even we wrote a paper, Scott and the Rosenbergs and I and Lisa wrote a paper together. And and I remember came out in biological theory several years ago, and and I was. Uh, I think I was the first author, so I was dealing with the with the manuscript a lot, and I would have to, you know, cross out sentences, <laughs> which would not fly with evolutionists, you know. And so, uh, and and but that's true in general. You talk to molecular biologists more generally, and they often make grandiose statements about evolution, and <laughs> and niches. I got into quite an interaction with Ford Doolittle recently, and he he's making statements about niches and communities and so forth, and. And uh, so, I mean, all the more power to them. I know it must sound patronizing, but all the more power to them that they're, that they're starting to engage with ecology and evolution at long last and not yeah. just view us as enemies taking up space in their building. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. But there was one um, a sentence uh, that I did get to see in uh, your paper with uh, uh, Hester. I thought might be a bit strong. Uh huh. And let me. Uh, it's in your section toward the end. What to do with the hologenome? Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, and so you so the sentence here is. Uh, I guess. Uh, as for the. Yeah. The term. The term hologenome has become divisive, and the older, older term metagenome should be used to describe the collective genetic material of a particular sample. And it's a great paper. I mean, I only read it this morning, you know, because you just sent it to me. Yeah, I'm but, sorry. <laughs> um, but it has a lot of it has a lot of great information in it, and and it's nice that you that you're able to identify these stable sets of bacteria, and. Uh, and separate those out from the sporadically arriving ones, and and uh, and that uh, the stable set is uh, is variable. However, uh, and so you're saying uh, it might be useful to develop the theory. Or was a great. Uh, Uh, so, I was trying to find a better sentence in here to quote. Uh, but basically, you're distinguishing between the hologenome theory of evolution and the notion of a hologenome, if I understand, if I, if that's fair to say, because it seems to me like the hologenome is. Um, a descriptive concept because it's it's 
just simply referring to, and, and you even say that that's the same as uh, the meta genome. Um, but I, I'm still using the term hologenome as I guess what you're calling the meta genome. It's just the union of the genes in the host with the genes in the microbes. And that seems like a very useful concept because that allows you to take as a state variable in your models the, com the combination of the host and uh, the microbes. If you did a coevolutionary analysis, then you'd be maintaining separate state variables, one of which would be for the, for the host, the other for the microbiome. And then uh, I don't think that would be as good a framework to represent what's going on if you're trying to maintain them as separate. So that's why I think holobiont theory and selection theory is different than coevolutionary selection theory because you're not maintaining separate state variables, you're maintaining a combined state variable and then proceeding to, to work that out. Um, what you're saying? What we're doing now, which might interest you, is that we're looking at like a, a holobiont um, yeah. explicitly, like we're just sequencing the whole damn thing together. So then we can do gene frequencies of, of the animal and of the zooxanthellae and of the, the, the viruses and the bacteria and et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying to get actually the, and we're doing that on several hundred uh, uh, uh -huh. uh, different organisms. And so, so it does give us this, I'm hoping it'll give us uh, a way to just do a, a, a relative gene frequency count across the whole thing. Across the whole, yeah, that really would be a holobion, a hologenome, a hologenotype. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it matches nicely how you first introduced it, right? Because that would give us something to work against. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm, for what it's worth, the person to introduce the notion of the hologenotype. Mm -hmm. And it's not theory loaded. You know, it's, it's, uh, but here's a sentence I wanted to, uh, write. Uh, it's under conclusions, and it's not under the section I was first looking. Mm -hmm. You're saying the results here support the holobiont model, the holobiont model, where the microbial and microbial members have individual evolutionary trajectories. Right, yeah. Um, and where the... Oh, Mac, I misread that. Support the holobiont model where the microbial and macrobial members have individual evolutionary trajectories. And that's the part where I don't think your data show that. Uh, I don't think, that seems to me to be a claim that uh, isn't known to be true. And uh, I know uh, the, the people in England, I think it's Foster or somebody, you know, they talk about this all the time as though, as though the microbes and the host have independent evolutionary trajectories. And I just don't think that's correct because I think there is an alignment, a partial alignment of interest between mm -hmm. the microbes and the host since the success of the microbes does depend in part on the success of the host. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can see that. So our, our working, um, like what we're working against, which is, um, so I don't, yeah, I don't want it too deep, but basically what um, my working version is that you have a, you basically do have two, let's call them meta populations for whatever, uh, whatever that means. And that you, they do evolve separately and then you put them together and then you get co-evolution and then you re, you keep doing that each time. Yes. They have ecological trajectories that are separate, but I think uh, Joan's point is that uh, at the evolutionary level, um, you can have that um, selection at the whole biont level. No, I get that. No, that's, that's actually what's nice because this is the first time we've actually had something where we're working against a real, um, sorry, I shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> we have a real theory to work against, right? As opposed to just the co-evolutionary theory. Yeah, so within one time step, Joan, you have 
uh, the ecological trajectory of the microbes, which right. is, yeah. Yeah. But then that's only one step in the evolutionary process. Yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, they, I think we should let you, <laughs> you don't have to suffer through because we can, we can keep going forever. Um, so uh, just one, first of all, thank you very much. Um, does anybody else in the group have a couple, like one or two quick questions? I have a sort of an offbeat question. We were talking a little bit about political considerations, but I'm just curious. Um, I, as a mathematician, I see all the game theory themes in this. And uh, so it, is game theory an integral part now of uh, population dynamics in biology or how does that work because you haven't mentioned uh, game theory and i think it would be a good thing for biologists to learn a little game theory because it looks like you're at least at your micro proliferation step that is in fact a game where you know where you, you have a uh an altruist and a selfish that's a little bit like the hawk the classical hawk dove uh, game and you have the notion of a um, uh, an evolutionarily stable state, which is like a, a Nash equilibrium. So, or a so I'm just curious, what what is the status of game theory in the in this biological world? Because I'm a little bit naive about it. Well. Uh... <laughs> it's it's really a big big deal. Uh, Maynard Smith uh, wrote a little book, uh, m maybe even 15, 20 years ago, called something like Game Theory and Evolution, and uh, introduced the ESS, the Evolutionarily Stable Strategy, as a sort of evolutionary counterpart of the Nash Competitive Equilibrium. And uh, it's very well accepted. Now, I just confess personally, that I'm more comfortable with dynamics than I am with uh, game theory. And uh, it's just not part of thinking in game theoretic terms. It's just not as intuitive to me as dynamics are. So that's why I tend to frame my modeling in dynamics first, and then to uh, use that to license a game theoretic analysis. Uh, the problem with game theory, in my view, typically is that uh, you can't know what the objectives are of the players. You, you have to make an assumption as to what the utility is or uh, what, the, uh, what the strategies are aimed at achieving. And that usually then rests on a dynamic process. Uh, and so once you have, and that's why I did the ES, my HSS idea right here at the end of a dynamic analysis, because then I had a dynamical criterion to use as the basis for strategic analysis between the host and the microbe. Now, uh, my, but then when you get into the strategic analysis itself, once, once you do have an acceptable um, goal, set of goals uh, or utilities for the, for the players, uh, some, sometimes it just gets compl so complicated and that, uh, it, uh, it's, it's a difficult literature for someone who's a biologist to, to engage with because there's the hawk dove game, which Maynard Smith in fact covered, but then there are dozens and dozens of other named games that game theorists get into. Um, right. And, and uh, it's hard to keep them all straight and uh, to know how seriously to take them. And sometimes game theoretic analysis is very, difficult mathematically and and so uh, it's and and as a as you know as a scientist i look at i evaluate models in terms of how many results do you get per unit formula All right. <laughs> and uh i think with game theory it's pretty low yield uh now i'm sure i'm going to get hate mail for that but uh that that tends to be the, the, where I'm coming from, my, my former student, uh, Ero Ace, um, 
uh, does do a lot of game theory. It's much more natural to him. So when we've done projects together, I'll frequently frame the, pro the problem uh, in a game theoretic, in, in, in a dynamical way. And then he'll take the same problem and recast it as a game. And, yeah, uh, it seems like your array of fitnesses is, um, is essentially the same information as a payoff. Yes, it is, yes. So, anyway, I just was curious about yeah. your uh, attitude about game theory. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's here to stay. And uh, uh, it's particularly helpful, especially when the dynamics doesn't work for, uh, do much for you because a lot of the frequency dependent processes are very nonlinear. And so the dynamical analysis winds up being itself too complicated to get anything out of. And so then the uh, uh, game theoretic solutions, when they can be boundary solutions or uh, corner solutions, wind up being very useful. But, but for mixed ESSs, where you have uh, you know, uh, um, the optimal configuration is a mixture of hawks and doves and so on, then they also get pretty complicated too. <laughs> so. Are you familiar with um, a book by Hofstetter and Zygmunt on evolutionary games and, or evolutionary games and um, yeah, I think it's evolutionary games. Yeah. It's a 1998 book, um, and he talks about the relationship between dynamical models and game theory and ties the, whole for the two formalisms together really beautifully. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I can just send you uh, the reference and you can maybe yeah. check it out if you can get a hold of it. Uh, yeah. Of course, you already said you're not particularly interested in game <laughs> theory, but in, if you <laughs> want to see the connection between dynamics and game theory that would be the reference to go to so. yeah oh i'd like to see the reference yeah and uh, uh <laughs> as long as we have to stay at home might as well read it huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, john i i have a question and it's, i think that it's nearby in your slides i missed when you were showing the graph that you explained that you had a a maximizing variable, which wasn't the holobiome fitness, but I missed which one was. So I guess that you call it L here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here it's. I'll tell you what it is. So we have this maximum, this criterion for uh, for holobiont that only has different strains, mm -hmm. right? And we have this one that has a max. Uh, the marginal fitness if they're only different alleles mm -hmm. then take the product of those two and you get that got it yeah that's all nothing fancy and i haven't proven that it's a lyapunov function i've merely shown it on a graph and so uh so the uh the steady state solution there does correspond to the maximum for that? Or? Yeah, yeah, for the maximum yeah. of that product. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I haven't proven it, I've um, illustrated it. Uh, so uh, for yeah. these, I was able to prove these, but uh, it's in the paper there. But uh, uh, this would involve, to prove this, I'd have to show a gradient flow mm -hmm. uh, up this thing, and I haven't done that. And you know, <laughs> um, Joan, I've got a question. If how, and I, I, it may actually be packaged, and I, I, I didn't see it, I missed it, um, or it can easily be added. What about if there's some sort of neutrality at some level, either the host level or within the micro uh, level? Uh, in terms of the of selection pressures, you know, there's just drift happening. Oh, well then, uh, then nothing happens uh, for that. So if you look down here, if you'd have neutrality, uh, then, well, uh, two things. So if you had neutrality, uh, then perhaps neither, perhaps nothing would change. So this would be, the uh, dynamics here for the strains, if, if the marginal fitness of strain one 
equaled the marginal fitness of strain two, these would divide out. But the problem is that the marginal fitnesses themselves depend on the, uh, ha have to be averaged over the hosts, over the uh, uh, nuclear genotype ratios. So if the nuclear genotype ratios change, then that would induce a change in the marginal fitnesses of the microbes as well. So that's why you would get a, uh, uh, an interaction. And you can see that here in that these uh, trajectories don't go straight in. You know, if, if, uh, if you're with me on this, if the, if the Jacobian around here of the equilibrium here was diagonal, then you'd get a f uh, the trajectories flowing in in, in a uh, um, uh, without any curvature. They'd be coming in just along the eigenvectors. But uh, since uh, the, I assume the, the uh, Jacobian here is not diagonal, so you're getting the trajectories coming in at, uh, over both eigenvalues at the same time, but with different levels at each eigen, with different eigenvalues at each eigenvector. You with me? I know what the Jacobian is. <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that would be the, li <laughs> the linearized dynamics in here uh, uh, are um, uh, uh, show that there's a coupling between the uh, both variables as they approach the equilibrium. Um, so you know, like you have the page of equations where you show the conditions needed to uh, uh, the next one, I think. Uh, or maybe the next, like that we show what it takes that this is the one and over here. Oh, wait, is this? The, yeah, the, the two, the second two lines, right? And so here yeah. you're showing what it needs to be stable, right? What it, you need to yeah, overcome for, any introduction of mutants and uh, Right, in a phenotypic space, yeah. Right. And so the first W is the, the is talking about the host phenotype. It must be better. Yeah. And, and the second one is this unpackaged one which includes the, the microbes right yep so do if and the second one for example is just neutral and and from just the microbe interaction neutral but that's where the, we still have the host interaction with the with the w's there is that correct yeah uh, that's because of the partial that's because of the partial alignment of the host with the microbe mm -hmm. so, so even if the mic so uh I mean, it's, it's very interesting, it's only a partial alignment. I mean, a lot of the thinking, a, a lot of the sort of picturesque thinking about holobionts is envisioning that they're working together as a, as a great team and, and, and everything will be hunky-dory. But the, the, what you have is that the microbe is dependent on the success of the host down here, but the host isn't dependent in the same way on the success of the microbe because uh, the, the microbes, the host fitness depends on the number of microbes and so on, but it not on the phenot uh, uh, the the host success on an individual basis isn't the ho the ho <laughs> let me put it this way. The microbe success depends on the individual su su success of the host it's living in, whereas the host doesn't depend on the individual success of the microbes. It just depends on the number of microbes. So that would be actually a really interesting dynamic where you have a, a much weaker selection or no selection at all uh, at one level with four yeah. microbes. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 that, that would uh, induce uh, yeah, that would do some microbial dynamics among neutral microbes. Can I ask, does the model here, does that already cover the idea of kind of conditional dysbiosis? That at some times a microbe is very good and then under other environmental conditions, that same microbe could be very detrimental to the host. Uh, cover, well, not as, not as written, but um, if you take these equations down here and these uh, 
array of fitnesses, all these array, this array of fitnesses right here could definitely be environment, is definitely dependent on the environment. So you could make these time dependent or environment dependent, and then you could uh, iterate these with time dependent fitnesses. Um, and you'd have to do that numerically, you know, with a computer, but the, but yeah, you could definitely do that. And it'd be kind of interesting because you could have it swinging one way or the other, depending, uh, you know, on the environmental conditions. I mean, Zizantelli is a classic example, you know, when it gets hot, yeah. it's very detrimental to the host. And so I was just wondering, you know, if that's, yeah, yeah that's, I, I can see that that could be incorporated. And I have another question. So, and this is kind of, I guess, just my lack of knowledge of how it all works at a more detailed level, but what would be the difference if you were, if you were doing a purely co-evolutionary model, what would be the different predictions from what this kind of, um, the holobiont as a whole unit of evolution, how would that differ than if these were just co-evolutionary um, parts? Um, no, I, I don't really know. I've been wrestling with that question because I've been trying to figure out just how to write down a co-evolutionary model that would be a fair counterpart to this, to compare to it. Um, now, we, we have decades of co-evolutionary models in the literature, um, and they always, as I say, have two separate state variables, one for, for, part, for species A, the other for species B, and separate equations for each. So you don't have a combined gene pool for both species. You have separate gene pools. Now, how, how would you do that here and still be true to the spirit of the, uh, of species A living inside species B? So that species, so, so that a selection event on the species, the enclosing species, also affected the enclosed species, or a selection on the host also affects the guest. Because, uh, you know, if a parrotfish comes along and takes a mouthful of coral, it, it has eaten both coral and the zooxanthellae. Now, a typical coevolutionary model would be a, 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 a flower and a pollinator. And when a hawk comes along and, and, uh, or a bee, bee eater comes along and eats a bee, it doesn't also eat the flower. The flower continues to live. And so we're getting this. Um, so I don't see how I could get a coevolutionary model that captures the uh, uh, spirit of what's going on in ho holobiont selection. And, and, you know, people ask me, well, why don't you have a holobiont model? Because if we had a holobiont model with a co, uh, if you, why don't you have a coevolutionary model? Because if we could compare that with a holobiont model, we could test uh, their different predictions. And that'd be great. But if I wrote down a holobiont, a, a coevolutionary model, then I think it would be immediately attacked as, as a straw man, as not a fair representation of what was actually going on. Uh, so if we had like a model for the zooxanthellae and then another model for the corals, and we had them as separate equations, so we had a gene pool for the corals and then a gene pool for the for the uh, zooxanthellae, and then they'd be on different time scales. So we'd have to run the time scale. We'd have to run the equation for the zooxanthellae fast compared to the time step for the uh, um, coral. And typically when that happens, if you have different time uh, speed, if you have different speeds for two parts of the system, you put the fast speed at, a, at equilibrium and then you bury it into the equation for the slow speed. So you have the, the zooxanthellae tracking then the evolution of the uh, uh, Carl. So that'd be the typical multi-scale uh, analysis. And so if you did that, you, you'd come out with a model, but I, I can definitely see people saying, well, that's just not comparable to your holobiont model. So, it's, so to make different predictions is not fair. <laughs> and so that's the problem I'm stuck with uh, on that. Uh, 
and especially with respect to something like um, uh, reduced parasite virulence, where if we look at something like myx myxomitosis, you know, in the rabbits, where that's always been interpreted as a case study in the evolution of reduced parasite virulence. But the myxomitosis is living inside rabbits. And, uh, and I just don't think it's obviously true that that is a coevolutionary uh, outcome. And I know if I say that, a lot of people can get real mad because this is a classic coevolutionary uh, co example. So they can get all bent out of shape over it. But um, <laughs> I, just, I just don't, don't know. Uh, but I, but I, you know, I really hear your question. I, I'm at a quandary as to quite how to address it. I mean, because to me, it seems like there's probably a little of both. There's, there's periods where there's, this is probably a whole unit. It's a holobiont. It's being selected on as a unit. But then there's periods of decoupling where it's clearly coevolution. Like, you know, the, the zooxanthellae get expelled mid-generation mid and go and sexually recombine and evolve on their own and then come back to the host as a whole yeah. new metapopulation. And so it's, it just seems like there, there needs to be a little of both. And I guess that's the thing is like, I can't think of a good way either that gives you like a, a comparable model where you can get both and, and kind of test against both and see which one you actually think is happening. Well, let's think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a, definitely worth pursuing. Yeah, no, and it's really valuable to, to really get, I mean, I think you're helping a lot by uh, helping codify it which we really need because we've been, we've been I mean you you've been pulled a little into the debate and it's mostly just uh it's just uh the better whoever can come up with the better words right <laughs> it's like the what the song and the songbird or what the hell is do <laughs> the, <laughs> song <laughs> the, singer, yeah. <laughs> the song and the singer is that right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. well thank you I think we should like let you uh uh, that was two hours of dealing with us, which is a lot. Um, so, um, one, we'll probably bug you at some time as we're moving through this again, because that was really valuable, I think.